This is lecture week five, uh, part one. Uh, this lecture is broken up into two parts. Uh, in the first part of this lecture, uh, we'll consider definitions uh, and measurement of poverty. Uh, and so, uh, more specifically, uh, we'll look at three uh, different uh, working definitions of poverty, absolute poverty, uh, relative poverty, and subjective poverty, and what those terms mean. Uh, we'll also uh, take a close look at the Census Bureau's uh, measurement of poverty and how they go about actually estimating uh, the poverty rates. Uh, that'll be a main focus of this lecture. Uh, and then we'll take a closer look at some of the demographics. And so we'll look at uh, poverty rates uh, by different age groups, by different race, uh, races, ethnicities, uh, to get a closer look at where some of the problems uh, are concentrated. Uh, and then we'll take uh, the, poverty, the current poverty rates and we'll compare across time and across different national contexts uh, to give us a better sense of uh, what those uh, terms mean. Uh, that'll be the first part of this lecture. Uh, in the second part of this lecture, uh, we'll look at the broader uh, policy issue, and that's uh, with respect to poverty and dependency, uh, or the work effort, and how to address both simultaneously. So it's much more feasible, I think, to, to address one issue or the other, uh, but to address both simultaneously has been the challenge over the years. And so we'll look at a tool that's been used uh, historically uh, to address both, and that's the use of the earnings disregard. And so we'll take a look at how that, uh, how that uh, mechanism, how that functions. Uh, but first, a uh, simple working definition of poverty. We uh, take an economic view of poverty in this class, uh, and so we define poverty as simply uh, economic deprivation. Uh, more specifically, uh, we're saying that it's uh, lacking the resources, uh, lacking the resources to maintain a minimally adequate uh, standard of living. Uh, and so that's our basic uh, general, or that's a general definition of, of poverty that we take in this class. Uh, there's certainly other uh, views, other definitions. Uh, Adam Smith, who is often credited with being the founding father of modern economics, had this to say uh, in giving us an intuitive sense of poverty. He says uh, that poverty is whatever the custom of the country, uh, and the emphasis is on the words, a custom of the country, uh, renders it indecent uh, for people uh, to be without. Uh, and so if you consider uh, as one example that uh, if uh, most everyone has a 4G smartphone, for example, uh, and if you're, uh, and if you uh, don't have a 4G smartphone, maybe that's uh, considered uh, to be uh, uh, poverty uh, in the sense that Adam Smith has in mind. So uh, I think what he's uh, suggesting here is that uh, there might be a relative sense uh, to poverty, that poverty uh, is uh, based on what others have in society. Uh, and so that's, uh, he's giving us an intuitive sense of poverty there. Uh, in terms of our working, uh, our actual working definitions of poverty, we have absolute relative and subjective poverty. Uh, first, absolute poverty is uh, typically expert-based. So uh, there's some expert that comes in and says uh, and establishes some thresholds uh, and uh, assesses income against those thresholds. So if your income is found to be less than those uh, thresholds, you're considered to be poor in an absolute sense. Uh, that's an absolute uh, view of poverty. Uh, poverty can have a relative sense uh, to it as well, just like uh, Adam Smith had in mind. So it could be relative to others in society. Uh, and so the typical indicator that we use to assess relative poverty, and this is on an international basis, really, uh, but uh, you might take uh, household median income, for example, and if you would take 50% of household median income, uh, and if your income falls below that threshold amount, uh, then you, you may be considered to be poor. Uh, and so uh, to give a specific uh, number here, so $50,502 $50, is the household median income for 2011. If you were to take 50% of that amount, and assess family income uh, or household income against that uh, threshold, then uh, that's, uh, that would be relative uh, conception of poverty. Uh, there's also subjective poverty. And this it's like it sounds. It's uh, subjective. So it's a product of individual consciousness. It's what you make of it uh, in your own mind. Uh, this is often survey-based. Uh, and so if, uh, if there's a survey that goes out asking you what, uh, what's the absolute minimum amount of income that you need to get by, uh, your response to that question would be uh, a subjective uh, view of poverty, an individual uh, view of poverty, in other words. So we have these three different uh, working definitions of poverty. Uh, and in the U.S., uh, we assess uh, absolute poverty. Uh, we use that particular measure uh, the most frequently. In terms of different justifications for why we actually want uh, a poverty measure, well, uh, taking a liberal view, uh, if uh, so assuming that uh, poverty is, in fact, uh, a concern that we want to address, poverty and inequality, that is, uh, then certainly we want to see uh, what sort of progress we made in the fight against poverty. That's uh, one particular justification. Uh, poverty, uh, taking these uh, measures of poverty also tells us uh, where the problems are. We certainly have limited resources to go around, so uh, 
uh, if we can uh, uh, locate where the problems are uh, in terms of uh, their concentrations and such, we can target our resources more effectively is, is what I'm getting at here. Uh, the poverty estimates get released in September of each year. So in September of each year, the numbers from the previous year will get released. And so currently, September 2012, we, uh, we just have, uh, we have the, uh, the numbers for 2011 just released. Every time these numbers get released, it draws attention to the issue uh, politically, and so that policymakers uh, will, will take these things into account uh, in, uh, uh, in addressing some of the policy issues. Uh, we sometimes use the poverty thresholds in estimating or in establishing eligibility for different uh, public programs. It certainly wasn't intended that way initially uh, by the researchers who had come up with these, these uh, first uh, thresholds, but uh, we have different uses for these thresholds uh, today. Uh, I had suggested that uh, uh, some of these uh, conceptions uh, matter more than others. So in the U.S., uh, we pay more attention to the absolute poverty uh, uh, estimates uh, than relative poverty estimates, or even subjective uh, for that matter, certainly. Uh, so if you'll consider this uh, exercise here, uh, consider a family of three, and uh, you have one parent, uh, two kids, uh, one child is 10 years old, you have a 10-year-old girl, uh, you have an eight-year-old boy living in Chicago uh, as of this year. Uh, what would uh, this family need in the way of rent and utilities uh, to get by? Uh, what's the minimum amount of income this family would need, get, uh, would need to get by? Uh, also consider uh, how much this family would need for food uh, as a second element here. And also, if you'll consider uh, what this family might need in the way of uh, personal expenses. Uh, and if you'll just informally uh, just take down those estimates and keep that estimate in mind uh, as we go through uh, this uh, description of poverty and how poverty how these poverty thresholds uh, get estimated, uh, we'll see how your estimates uh, compare against the official uh, census uh, thresholds. So historically, uh, poverty was first measured back in the early 1960s by an economist uh, named Molly Orshansky. Uh, she was working at the Social Security, uh, Social Security Administration, working, uh, doing some research on uh, the senior population. Uh, and so she was the first one to come up with their very first uh, poverty estimates. Uh, there were two, uh, two mechanisms or two parts uh, to that poverty estimate. Uh, she had to come up with the thresholds first and then assessing uh, some type of resources against those thresholds. Uh, and so in coming up with the thresholds, uh, she essentially took uh, a basic food budget. Uh, so what a family would need uh, in the way of a food budget to get by. And so there was some research at the time suggesting that uh, most families spend about one third of their uh, budget on food. And so she multiplied that cost uh, by three uh, adjusting for different sizes uh, of our family sizes and that's uh, th those were our very first uh, poverty thresholds uh, and then with those thresholds she assessed uh, different family incomes uh, families of different sizes of course uh, their incomes against those thresholds to come up with their very first uh, poverty estimates uh, these uh, poverty estimates or these thresholds uh, for that matter um, uh, were not intended uh, to establish eligibility uh, for different programs uh, but we've uh, they were simply for research purposes, but we've uh, taken these estimates and these poverty thresholds and we've put, uh, we've put them through a much uh, different use certainly today. Uh, in terms of uh, the Census uh, Bureau and how they estimate poverty today, uh, we look at four different uh, dimensions uh, to what they're uh, considering. So first, in terms of the resources, uh, they have to consider what resources to count. So will they consider income? Will they consider assets? Uh, will they consider uh, cash benefits or near cash benefits from the government, taxes and transfers? These are all considerations that uh, the Census Bureau must, uh, must take into account in estimating poverty. Also, uh, they have to take into account the appropriate unit of analysis. So is it the family unit that we measure? Is it the household unit? Do we measure poverty on an individual basis? These are the considerations here. And then we have to con uh, consider the threshold. What do we, uh, do we simply retain the Molly Orshansky threshold? adjusting for changes in prices over the years, uh, or, do we, or uh, do we find that there's some other threshold uh, that's more appropriate? Uh, so uh, that's a huge issue, and a lot of uh, criticism uh, directed at the thresholds. Excuse me. And then we have to assess uh, the relevant time period. Uh, we can estimate poverty on an annual basis, on a monthly basis, on a more long-term basis. These are uh, the last set of considerations in estimating uh, poverty. So first, in terms of the resources. So we count uh, we count gross cash income when estimating poverty. This is the Census Bureau. Uh, the Census Bureau will take into uh, consideration gross cash income, so it doesn't take into account uh, near cash benefits of food stamps. Your SNAP benefits aren't uh, calculated 
uh, as part of your income uh, when estimating poverty. Uh, any sort of taxes and transfers are not counted. This is gross uh, income. Uh, and so uh, your taxes, uh, EITC benefits uh, received, uh, these are not considered. Uh, we also ignore non-discretionary expenses. So these are your expenses over which you have no control. Uh, one example might be your alimony payments or your child support payments that you that you make. Uh, so we uh, we consider gross cash income. So this, this is income uh, before all of those things are taken into account. Uh, we have to assess the appropriate unit of, an unit of analysis. And uh, to do so, we look at uh, the family unit. Uh, we don't consider a household income. We don't consider individual income. We consider the family. So anyone related by blood, marriage, or adoption, we're going to consider uh, their income in estimating poverty. So uh, we're not looking at uh, same-sex uh, unions, uh, the resources of your partner. Uh, if you're living with a boyfriend or girlfriend, we don't consider your boyfriend or girlfriend's uh, uh, resources. Uh, and then uh, this is uh, for the non-institutionalized population. So anyone who's institutionalized, uh, if, you're in, if you're in prison, if you're in a mental health facility, in a long-term facility, if you're living with roommates, if you're in a college dorm, for example, we're not going to count uh, those in institutions or uh, the person's, uh, their resources. Uh, and so this is, uh, we look at just the family members uh, outside of institutions. In terms of the threshold that we use, we use the same uh, threshold that Molly Oshansky determined. So uh, that basic food budget multiplied by three, uh, we've adjusted that. Uh, that threshold, those thresholds uh, by uh, inflation, by changes in prices over the years, uh, that threshold will, will differ uh, depending on the size of the family. Uh, it'll be higher uh, for families of different, uh, for larger uh, uh, families with different, for larger uh, families. Uh, and then, of course, we also adjust for the age of the household head. Uh, the thresholds will be lower uh, for, for uh, families uh, with, headed by uh, someone who's uh, older than 65 and the threshold will be higher uh, for families headed by, young, uh, by someone younger than 65, and so adjust, uh, we adjust accordingly. I had suggested before that there are numerous uh, criticisms of these thresholds. Uh, namely, uh, you have some people out there saying that uh, that old assumption that food comprises one-third of a family's budget, that it's outdated. If you look at some of the research today, uh, they suggest that food comprises about one-sixth of a family's budget, so that's one particular criticism that's thrown out there about these thresholds. Uh, we also don't take into account uh, regional differences in cost of living. So whether you're living in Chicago or New York or San Francisco or maybe the boonies, for example, uh, it's the same threshold throughout. Uh, and so uh, that's one particular criticism that uh, we should be adjusting uh, for these differences in cost of living. Uh, we do, however, uh, adjust for standard of living. Uh, so these uh, thresholds are, are, in fact, adjusted for changes in prices over time. Uh, some suggest that we shouldn't be ch uh, adjusting for changes in prices, but uh, essentially uh, taking into account uh, changes uh, in wages, uh, but uh, these are price indexed, these are not uh, wage indexed. Uh, and the criticisms uh, go on and on. Uh, some, other, some others uh, suggest that maybe we should take uh, in-kind benefits into account, so maybe uh, your food stamp or your SNAP benefits, uh, maybe some health insurance benefits, these are not considered uh, when estimating poverty, so there's some other uh, criticisms out there as well. Uh, finally, uh, we have to assess the relevant time period. We uh, measure poverty on an annual basis. It's not uh, monthly that we take uh, these poverty estimates. It's not. Uh, we don't look at long-term poverty necessarily. The long-term poverty uh, is the more uh, relevant issue, it seems to be. Uh, most families who are poor uh, stay poor for longer periods of time, uh, but uh, we assess poverty on an annual basis. Uh, if you look at the most recent uh, thresholds, uh, recall uh, the little exercise that we did in which you estimated uh, what a family of three would need uh, in Chicago uh, in the way of rent, utilities, in the way of food, in the way of personal expenses. Uh, the, the official threshold, the annual threshold for family of three uh, for 2011 is $17,916. So if you have less than $17,916 and you have three people in your family unit, uh, then you're considered to be poor. Uh, and so you can see how that uh, assesses, uh, how that uh, weighs up against uh, measures against your particular uh, estimate that you come up with. Uh, I note uh, one alternative measure of poverty. We could have said, uh, let's take median household income, that's $50,502, and take half of that amount, 50% of the, that amount, uh, which would yield uh, $25,251 and assess household income against that amount, that would be uh, an, an, other, an alternate definition of, of poverty that we could take. Uh, that would be a relative view of poverty, certainly. Uh, 
uh, but uh, in your slides we'll see that we have absolute uh, markers or absolute definitions of poverty. In looking at uh, who's poor in the U.S. in terms of the uh, basic demographics and such, uh, we're using the official census definition that we just outlined. Uh, we're looking at pre-tax uh, family income. Uh, so we use the same Molly Ruchansky thresholds. We're looking at family income uh, assessed annually uh, and, of course, adjusting for different family sizes uh, and composition. Uh, you'll see here uh, in your slides that uh, the poverty rate happens to be 15% for 2011. That's the most recent estimate that we have, 15% poverty uh, for the last year. Uh, for the different, uh, this is a breakdown by the different races, but uh, you have white, not, not Hispanic. Uh, the poverty rate, or in other words, the risk of being in poverty for that particular group was 9.8% in 2011. Uh, for blacks, alone or in combination, some persons self-identify with more than one race. So, uh, so given that consideration, so given that little note, uh, blacks alone or in combination, the poverty rate or the risk of being in poverty was 27.6% for 2011. Uh, you see that the rate was 25.3% for Hispanics and so on and so forth. Uh, we see the different breakdowns uh, according to different uh, age groups. So the poverty rate uh, within uh, the under 18 age group was 21.9%. So the highest rate of poverty is among uh, kids. Uh, kids are at 21.9%. Uh, and we do a fairly good job of keeping the elderly out of poverty. Uh, we have an 8.7% poverty rate. Uh, for seniors uh, as those at uh, 65 and older. Uh, you'll notice that uh, poverty composition, uh, you'll notice in your slides that is, uh, that poverty composition is different uh, from poverty rates. The poverty rates assess uh, the risk of poverty for each uh, particular group. Uh, the poverty composition is just essentially uh, indicating uh, who is poor. Uh, so who, what is what does the poor look like? What do the poor look like in other words? So uh, given the poverty population, which comes out to 46 million uh, 247,000 individuals uh, in 2011. Uh, who was poor uh, among uh, that group? So, if you look at the poverty composition, it looks much different uh, than the risk of poverty within each group. Uh, the poverty composition is actually highest uh, for the white population, for white, not Hispanic. Uh, it's 41.5 percent. So, whites make up uh, the largest uh, percentage of the, the, the poor population. Uh, and you see that Hispanics uh, are at 28.6% uh, of the poverty uh, population. This is a much different uh, picture uh, that's painted when you look at uh, composition as opposed to rates. Uh, if we're looking at a the age breakdown, so poverty composition is highest among the working age population uh, at 57.3%. Uh, the, the point of distinguishing between poverty rates and poverty composition is just to, to realize that uh, the numbers, uh, depending on how you uh, uh, interpret these numbers, uh, it's a much different picture uh, whether you're looking at poverty rates and poverty composition. So please uh, keep that in mind uh, when you read through uh, the literature. Uh, we assess uh, the most recent data. So 15% is uh, the current population survey estimate uh, for 2011. Uh, this is not an all-time record. Our all-time record was when we first estimated poverty. We were at uh, about 22.1% during the war on poverty era back in the 1960s. Uh, we have 46.2 million individuals uh, living in poverty. That's about uh, 9 or 10 million families. Uh, this is also not a record. Uh, we had a record last year, actually, in the absolute number of people living in poverty. Uh, it's, uh, so uh, there is not a statistical difference uh, between the poverty uh, uh, estimates uh, last year and this year, uh, but uh, we're still at a pretty high number there. Uh, you can see that the trajectory uh, over the last few years, so back in 2008, uh, we were at 13.2%. 2009, we were at 14.3%. Uh, 2010, we were at 15.1%. Excuse me, and we're at 15% this year. So uh, you see the tra uh, trajectory. Uh, we've seen increases in the last few years, but uh, not much of a difference, uh, not a significant difference between 2010 and 2011. If we're looking at any changes uh, within particular groups, uh, we, we didn't see much of an increase or decrease, for that matter, uh, within any particular group. Uh, we did see actual drops, uh, so that's, uh, that's somewhat uh, new, uh, is that we did see a drop in poverty uh, among uh, Hispanics. Uh, so 26.5% to 25.3% uh, 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 between 2010 and 2011. And also for non-citizens. Non-citizens, uh, the poverty rates went from 26.8% uh, to 24.3% uh, between 2010 and, and 2011. So uh, 
Uh, the point here is that uh, we see uh, very small increases or decreases uh, usually, so less than 1%, but uh, these are uh, increases or decreases, decreases in this case, uh, of more than 1% for these particular groups. In thinking about 15%, uh, we can assess 15% uh, uh, over time and across different national contexts uh, if we're looking across time. So I show you a graph of uh, what poverty uh, looks like over time. Uh, the top line uh, in your slide there, uh, if, you, if you're looking at the top line first, that's the uh, absolute number of people in poverty. So uh, we were uh, at a previous all-time high back in the 1960s. We were at around 40 million individuals living in poverty. Uh, we saw a decrease in the 70s, uh, and then we've seen uh, sort of gradual increases uh, throughout the years. Uh, we're at an all-time high uh, last year uh, at uh, more than 46.3 million people. Uh, the estimate, the current population survey estimate is at 46.2 million, million people this year. Uh, so we've seen increases uh, recently. Uh, the poverty rates uh, were not at an all-time high. Uh, we were at an all-time high back in the, uh, the early 60s at 22%. Uh, we've been somewhere between 10% and 15%, uh, mostly over the years, uh, and now we're at 15%. So we've reached 15% uh, in the last couple of years. Um, that's uh, just a little bit about poverty uh, over time and across different national contexts. So uh, the, the graph that I offer you guys uh, is a little bit outdated. So this is uh, from 2000. We're looking at some of the OECD countries, the Organization uh, for Economic Cooperation and Development. And we see how poverty differs across different uh, national contexts. Uh, you see that uh, uh, the, the dark blue bars, the dark blue bars uh, in your slides, uh, this is uh, poverty, uh, uh, relative poverty. So assessing poverty on a relative scale. Uh, poverty is highest in the US and Ireland uh, as of uh, 2000. And you see some of the countries that are doing uh, better in the way of poverty. So Sweden and Finland are doing much better in the way of poverty uh, as of 2000, the most recent estimates that I have. Uh, the light blue uh, bars uh, indicate uh, absolute poverty. Some countries uh, don't have, uh, don't yield any uh, estimates of absolute poverty, but uh, uh, so uh, the UK, the UK in terms of absolute poverty is the highest uh, with US, with the US uh, being second. Uh, and then of course, again, you see some of the countries that are doing much better. Uh, Austria, uh, Belgium are much lower in the way of absolute poverty. So uh, the point here is that uh, cross nationally speaking, uh, the U.S. has higher uh, relative rates of poverty, certainly, than any other country, any other OECD country, any other rich country. Uh, and the U.S. has uh, the second highest rate of absolute poverty uh, among the OECD countries here. And so in this next section of the lecture, we'll consider uh, the policy issue of, of how to address poverty and dependency and sim simultaneously what the government has done uh, historically.